Hello, this is Josh Blackman, and welcome to the 2022 Harlan Institute Ashbrook Virtual Supreme Court Competition. This year, we're arguing the case of students of fair admission. This is the round of eight, and we're honored to have Campbell Collins and Gabrielle Lovins representing petitioners. And we have Peter Ber Berlazov and Emily Helquist who are representing the respondents. Petitions begin whenever you're ready. May it please the court. My name is Campbell Collins, and along with my co-counsel, Gabrielle Levins, I represent the petitioner, Students for Fair Admission, in this case. The University of North Carolina employs a race-based affirmative action policy that violates the Equal Protection Clause of the, of the Constitution by giving some races a benefit that others do not receive. This is unconstitutional for three reasons. First, the educational benefits of diversity is not a compelling state interest. Second, Grutter should be overturned. And third, respondents' attempts at historical justification fail. First, a race-based admissions policy can never meet strict scrutiny because the educational benefits of diversity are not a compelling state interest. Therefore, Grutter should be overturned. Balling v. Sharp held that classifications based solely upon race must be scrutinized with particular care since they are contrary to our traditions and hence constitutionally suspect. Therefore, we're looking at this under a strict scrutiny lens, and we have to decide the compelling state interest. Educational benefits of diversity is not a compelling state interest. Um, in his dissent in Grutter, Justice Thomas laid out what compelling state interest is, interests look like. They can be national security, safety from violence, and the functioning of government. The educational benefits of diversity, though a laudable goal, do not meet that high standard for a true compelling state interest. Furthermore, remedying past societal discrimination is not an appropriate just, uh, justification for affirmative action policy, policies, as this court has held both in Shavi Hunt and in the University of California, Vibaki because the realm of past societal discrimination is not an appropriate realm for the Supreme Court to enter into. So we must look to colorblindness in affording educational opportunities in order to prevent uh, prohibited discrimination under the 14th Amendment. All right, counsel, let me jump in. <clears throat> and you're asking us here to overrule Grutter, right? And in yes, recent years, this court has overruled a lot of cases. Just last year, we overruled Roe v. Wade, we overruled Casey. We have ruled the lemon test. We have ruled cases involving labor relations. It, it seems that every year with this new majority, we're just overruling cases left and right. At some point, doesn't this affect the court's legitimacy that if people see that, well, you have these new judges and all these cases that are half a century old are going away. Don't we have to be cognizant of that at some point? Doesn't that harm us as a court? Well, yes, Your Honor. Following stare decisis is important, and it is important to maintain um, a body of case law that is stable. But that doesn't mean that decisions that were wrong should continue to be upheld. But 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 from the public's perception, they've been using affirmative action for half a century, and all of a sudden they can't do it anymore, right? And in some regards, this is even bigger than Dobbs. In Dobbs, at least half the states still allow abortion, half don't. There's potential to travel. But now we're telling New York and California, uh, I'm sorry, California is an outlier perhaps, but we're telling New York and other states, no, you can't use affirmative action, right? Um, isn't this something that really weakens the court's perception in the public square? Well, no, Your Honor, and that's because because Brown was right, Grutter is wrong. Brown denied um, any authority to use race as a factor in affording educational opportunities, and Grutter goes directly against that. So there is this contradiction in the are, case. Are you saying that the segregationists in Brown are no different than the <laughs> diversity officers in UNC? Are they like the same same thing? Constitutionally, Your Honor, that is the same thing. Well, because I mean, I, I mean, one is pretty odious. One was preaching racial supremacy. The other one's doing quite the opposite, trying to have diversity of thought and 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 and, and race on their canvases. How how are they the you know how how do you how do you analogize to people wearing coats to people wearing DEI badges? Well, well, Your Honor, we have to look at um, how how affirmative action laws are harming some minorities. This isn't a program that provides a just a perfect fix to discrimination and problems with race in America. And we can't look to government or schools receiving government funding to fix those problems. Um, as Justice Powell said in Baki, fixing societal ills is not something we can do through affirmative action or other um, laws like that. 
So while affirmative action is attempting to do something good, it's attempting to be laudable. Um, it's not a compelling state interest and it is still harming some minorities, although it, it isn't as, it, it is still at the end of the day, harming some minorities and giving some races a benefit over others. Can I well, ask I a, a follow-up question? Oh, go ahead, uh, Justice Liu. So I don't think anyone who supports these policies is saying they're perfect. The good opinion acknowledges that there are conflicting challenges, but it did say we should at least give this at least 25 years. I don't think it's been 25 years since Kruger yet and consider it kind of year by year. I mean, are you saying we don't have problems with race that could benefit from some of these policies to get access to students who wouldn't otherwise get in? Well, no, Your Honor, it's not that the country still doesn't have problems with race. It's that using race to afford educational opportunities isn't an appropriate remedy for those problems. And Grutter does have that kind of sunset provision where it lays out this loose guideline of we should be looking 25 years in the future and maybe we won't need those policies anymore. And so the idea that affirmative action policies need to have an end point even under Grutter needs to be integral to how those policies are implemented. But that's I not suppose what my mean. question to you is, are you why, why does the endpoint need to be now? I mean, I, I think there, there's still people alive today who uh, remember segregation or remember the litigation that was ongoing during their lifetimes. I mean, it, wouldn't it be reasonable to say we, we need a little more time still, uh, maybe another decade or two decades and, and to end it now would be premature? Well, Your Honor, there are other ways that we can achieve those same goals without classifying people um, by their race. So we've seen other states such as Oklahoma achieve the same educational benefits of diversity and even see increased racial diversity without classifying people by race. And as Justice Scalia said, I believe it's Scalia, the best way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is I think, to I think that was I think that was Chief Justice Roberts, but, but you, can, you can go on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the best way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. So I want to pick up there and, and push a little bit on your rather conclusive, or I, I guess strong argument, maybe I'll put it. So you're arguing that we should uproot Grutter, Root and Branch, and that the student body diversity is never a compelling interest. But what strikes me is that a lot has changed in the world since Barbara Grutter filed her complaint against Michigan Law School in 1997. I mean, as we are evidence here speaking on Zoom, lots of universities are having classes online. And one of our rationales in Grutter for why student body diversity was so important, so compelling, was that it allows students to see each other and see a more diverse student body. And what strikes me is that when you offer classes on Zoom, as many universities are doing, that you can reach out to students literally across the ocean and see a much more diverse student body, potentially. Or as we know, you can also have students who don't turn their cameras on and you can't actually see their races. So student body diversity is not evident necessarily. And I guess what I'm wondering is why would you ask us to have such a, a strong student body diversity is never compelling as opposed to a fact intensive inquiry case by case where we can make that sort of a determination. Well, Your Honor, that's because there's this kind of inherent contradiction in the way Grutter looks at race. Grutter does say, you know, that we, we should be looking to have diverse classes um, to have this kind of aesthetic of diversity in order to uh, introduce students to other students of different races. But the way that Grutter does that is by categorizing and classifying students based on their race. And we can see this from what's happening in the UNC admissions office. Uh, admissions officers are making statements like, if it is brown and above a 1300 SAT, put them in for the Merit Excel scholarship. Or let's just try and give these brown babies a chance at merit money. The fact- well, Yeah, I, well, I understand that, but you know, there's a, an amicus brief submitted here by the Association of American Medical Colleges that if you have black and brown doctors, that health outcomes go up for black and brown patients. So I understand your, where you're going, your point here, but I'm wondering why is that a bad thing in all situations? I, I, coming back again to why should this not be a fact-specific inquiry to see how pernicious the use of race was in this situation? Well, Your Honor, we can see that well, the, the problem here is they're categorizing students by their race and we can achieve the same racial benefits, if not better, 
or same benefits of racial diversity without categorizing students by race. But, but, but Justice Nelson's saying that they can't. We have all these briefs from California and other states saying it won't work. We have these briefs from doctors saying it won't work. How do you address that evidence in Justice Nelson's uh, question? Well, Your Honor, that's because um, even if achieving racial diversity is a laudable goal, even if it's a good thing to do, that doesn't make it. So, so you're saying it's okay if people die, that if there are not black doctors, that people die. That's, that's okay with you? You're good with that? Well, no, Your Honor. We're saying that uh, the way to achieve more black doctors is not to categorize future black doctors based on their race and afford them educational op outcomes based on their race. And I see our time is up, so we will briefly. Yes. Think okay. Th thank you for, for finishing on time, Counselor. Okay. Uh, respondents, you'll have your 15 minutes. Be whenever you're ready. Okay, we are ready. May you proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I am Emily Helkvist, and this is my co-counsel, Peter Berlazov, and together we represent the respondent side in Students for a Fair Admission versus the University of North Carolina. As respondents in this case representing UNC, we contend that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does not prohibit UNC's narrowly tailored usage of race in a holistic application process to achieve the educational benefits provided by a diverse class. We contend that this court should affirm for three reasons. Affirmative action used in the way that UNC does is constitutional under decades of Supreme Court precedent. And secondly, affirmative action furthers the school's compelling interest in achieving campus diversity in a narrowly tailored way. And finally, race is considered by UNC as part of a 40 factor holistic process while maintaining that merit is the number one consideration. We'd now like to open ourselves up to questions from the justices. Uh, if the justices are interested in asking us questions on specific issues which were brought up sure. by our friends on the other side, such as diversity being a compelling state interest. Well, let's start there then, right? Um, this court has defined <laughs> compelling interest in a very high level of abstraction in the past, right? national security, right? The, the security of the state. It would seem that, you know, having a diverse classroom, you might learn something from a diverse classroom. That's, you know, that's important. That, that's maybe really important. But how do you show it rises to the level of compellingness? How does it meet that high threshold? Right. Um, Your Honor, the petitioners in this case uh, merely stated that the consideration of educational benefits is not a compelling state interest, but did not provide evidence as to that fact. But when the court was considering that to be a compelling state interest, that is because the court found that having a diverse classroom significantly bolsters the educational outcomes across different racial lines. Agreed, agreed. Educational outcomes are increased. I'll just stick with this group. Why is that compelling? I mean, we're talking at a very high bar here. And I mean, by the way, Gruder's in, is in flux. Maybe Gruder's wrong. I'm asking you to tell me why is that compelling? Right. Um, Your Honor, if we are looking at compelling state interest as something at a very high level, the nation's educational advancements and the educational equity of that nation uh, are actually a serious thing for uh, the advancement of that nation and an economic perspective and a social perspective. And uh, these reasons are clearly very compelling because this is a government interest to ensure that our citizens are able to advance and our citizens are able to have educational opportunities equally. Well, wait, can I, I wanna ask a related question that I asked your opposing counsel. So, okay, so let's assume that a, a student gets admitted based on their race to a university and their entire educational program is online. So they show up to Zoom for every class and they have the sort of professors who are totally fine with them never turning their camera on. How is race a compelling interest in attaining any of the educational benefits when we can't, we literally can't, uh, how is student body diversity compelling when we can't see students' bodies? Well, I'm, uh, Your Honor, uh, race is an important factor um, because without it, the application process would be neglecting some of the students' personal experiences. So uh, in the context of educational uh, benefits in an online world, for example, you know, um, when you have discussion based classes, you know, you're drawing on individual experiences that could potentially shape, you know, your worldview and how you. But, look all right. At so, counsel, let me give you an example. Right. Let's say you have a, a wealthy neighborhood uh, outside of Chicago where you have uh, a wealthy black family lives next door to a wealthy white family. These kids are best friends. They grew up together, hang out each other every holiday together. Right. And they both apply to UNC. Um, how do you know that the student with the darker skin color brings certain experiences that the student with the lighter skin color won't? How do, how do you know that? 
uh, Your Honor, beyond certain disparities between racial groups, which we'll, we'll address in a second, according to a Kaiser Family Foundation study, more than 70% of Black Americans in the United States have experienced threatening I'm asking you on the, the example I gave, right? But how do you, how do you not, how do you know on a case by case basis, just by looking at a person's skin color, where, what experiences they'll, they'll provide? Um, Your Honor, we can't. And the whole purpose of a 40 Why do you have a checkbox? Then why is it so important to categorize people with a checkbox right at the, the, the top of the application? Your Honor, uh, on the Common App, race, while there is a red asterisk next to it, um, there is an option that the, uh, that an applicant can choose to provide with prefer not to say. So what, what if this court holds that we ban the use of the Common Applications checkbox? Would that be okay? Your Honor, we would not support that decision because it's important for universities to be able to consider personal backgrounds of applicants. And but you're not considering personal backgrounds, you're considering skin color. That, that's, that, that's only one metric. Put, put aside the personal statement. We'll get to the personal statement in a moment. All you're considering is your skin color. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, however, it is our belief that an individual's, uh, an individual's uh, skin color in the United States unfortunately frequently do influence their personal background. Let's say a person's Ni Nigerian and they grew up in Nigeria in a very wealthy family that connects that had, you know, oil, oil oil interests in Nigeria. They never step foot in the United States, but they check off black. What do you do with that person? Well, Your Honor, just because someone's social economic uh, status, you know, is higher than average does not mean that they don't have other adversities that, uh, that they didn't have to overcome in life, right? right let, let's so, pivot to law for a bit. So let's talk a bit about the Reconstruction Congress. And your friends on the other side point to various legislation passed in the 1860s, right? And they argue, though, that those laws were remedial in nature, right? And this court has held that you can use race to remediate past discrimination. Are you making a remedial argument in this case? Our argument is primarily not focused on remediation because remediation was not acknowledged as being a compelling interest in Baki. Uh, however, uh, we do believe that a lot of the precedent, a lot of the cases in the aftermath of the Reconstruction Congress do show that remediation in some forms can be an acceptable government value. But, but is this remediation, in other words, is UNC making an argument-based remediation here? Could you repeat that question? Is is the University of North Carolina making argument based on remediation here? Uh, no, Your Honor. Our primary argument is on the basis of the positive. Okay, education. so if, if the historical evidence in the 1860s involving racial classifications is remedial in nature, what can you ground your policy in other than Grutter, right? What history can you ground your policy in? Uh, Your Honor, we believe that there is a substantial amount of precedent in the United States law, which has shown us that the Constitution is not as colorblind as our friends on the other side would claim. We believe that the very the existence of things like the Freedmen's Bureau is one part of the evidence for that. However, in addition, the fact but they that they say it's remedial, but they say the Freedmen's Bureau is remedial to remediate. It's called the freedmen who were freed slaves, right? It's in the very nature of the of the of the rule. Yes, Your Honor, but we do not believe that slavery was a colorblind institution in the United States. I know you don't believe that, right? I know you don't believe that, but the the, the Supreme Court has said remedial is different. So, for example, was City of Richmond v. Croson and Bakke, were those, in other words, was Bakke a deviation from what we discussed with remedial measures, right? Did Grutter deviate from City of Richmond? Uh, we don't believe that Grutter fundamentally focused on the remedial uh, nature. No, I know that, but did, did, did Grutter deviate from City of Richmond v. Croson? Uh, Your Honor, would you be able to would you be able to elaborate on uh, the City of Richmond? Right, C City of Richmond was a case in the 1980s that involved uh, government contracting, and 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 uh, Richmond, of course, was a capital confederacy. They had lots of segregation over the course of many years, but the court said that this uh, a set aside policy was not attempt to remediate past discrimination, right? It was just about trying to promote, I might say, diversity or to promote more racial inclusion, right? Um, we have this line in the cases between remedial versus diversity, right? And it seems that diversity cases are sort of outliers. I'm asking you to think of how do we, how do we reconcile these sort of outlier cases? Well, Your Honor, um, UNC's policy is focusing on diversity and um, because of the because of the educational benefits that it provides um, 
while it can seem remedial in nature, it is actually focused on diversity. And uh, because diversity of thought, diversity of experience, as uh, Justice N Nelson has, man has, has mentioned, is really important. In right? other words, we are not focusing on diversity because we believe that we're righting a wrong. We're rather focusing on diversity because we believe that it's an interest for our institution that would assist in our institution's uh, development and the development of our students. Okay, I'm gonna proceed. You, you said something at the beginning about we consider race, but merit is is still the most important. I mean, isn't there some? Isn't that just like a like a platitude that can't possibly be factually accurate? I mean, aren't you, in, to some extent, removing merit or whatever other race neutral criteria you're looking at, and then adding race as a factor? Because there's going to be some people who are getting in who wouldn't have otherwise gotten in because of their race, right? Your, your point is that these policies are needed. They do have benefits, right? That means there's going to be people getting in because of a certain racial category that wouldn't otherwise be getting in. Isn't that antithetical to merit? Right, Your Honor, I'd say we have two kind of refutations to that point. The first one is that we it's not necessarily a head-to-head -head matchup where it's a Black student going against an Asian student and race is not the deciding factor. In, in a very a large number of cases, it's only a influencing factor in less than 5%. But our second argument is that the reason that we ask for race and components of applicants' backgrounds is because it's very important to understand individual starting points and certain struggles that they've gone through in their lives. Our belief is that race is part of a host of things about an individual's background, which can influence their worldview, influence their um, perseverance and their ability to survive through difficult conditions. It's the same thing uh, as saying that an individual who is high income does not necessarily have any other struggles. The saying that someone uh, being of a different skin color does not necessarily make them a victim of discrimination does not take into account that the vast majority, more than a super, a super majority, have personally been victims. But are you still, is that still a stereotype though? Aren't you still treating people as a debtor class because of their skin color? To quote Justice Scalia. Well, Your Honor, the whole purpose of a 40 factor application process by you and C. Oh, I mean, look, I mean, look, I, I know you have 40 factors, but some factors are more important than others, right? I mean, you can say. Well, I, yeah. Let me just go to this point, right? You're tr I know you're trying to say it's not a zero sum game, but it is, isn't it? I mean, like, if I, I, you hear the platitude, your race can only help you, it can never hurt you, right? But how can that logically, factually possibly be true if your own argument is that if we don't have these policies, we're not going to get the kind of diversity we want of, of race? That means your policy is admitting some people who wouldn't otherwise be admitted. And doesn't that mean you're re also reducing other racial groups in order to increase representation of the groups you're trying to increase? Your Honor, we believe that we consider race in a, in a multifaceted way. We don't necessarily just use race to you know, give black students a boost. Uh, race on the application could help anyone who has a strong experience or a strong development process uh, as a result of their racial category. So let's consider an applicant who, I don't know, may be Swedish and may have come from Sweden, or whose family background may be Swedish. Uh, side note, that's, that's my partner. But uh, you would consider that person's experiences uh, with having the fact that she is Swedish in your mind, because that has greatly contributed to her life experiences. The reason why we kind of consider Black applicants with the racial category more is because the in the United States, that is actually a much more severe category. Okay, now let's talk about Asian Americans, right? Uh, there are briefs filed by various groups who document there's uh, overt discrimination against Asian Americans, uh, that they have to de-Asianify their resumes. I mean, not all groups benefit from UNC's policy here. Well, we understand that um, uh, that Asian Americans uh, in some cases can be hurt by the policies of, a, of affirmative action. We're not barring Asian Americans from entering schools. Um, and, and furthermore, in the strive for equality, we unfortunately can't always benefit everyone. It's not, um, a, there is no perfect, sol perfect solution. And, um, and sometimes like, you know, right now, Asians are getting the short end of the stick. But um, future- I, are, you, are you, I'm sorry, did you, did you stipulate the Asians getting the short end of the stick? Did you just say that? I'm sorry. Uh, Your Honor, I, 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 I don't think that's your position. 
uh, what my partner is referring to is that our overarching goal is to establish a diverse and equal environment. Yeah, but, but, but if Asians are getting the short end of the stick, then your policy is not doing a very good job, right? You're helping some racial groups, not others. We're not doing it in a way that's necessarily a, a zero sum game. But it, it has to be zero sum. I mean, even Baki recognizes if there are a fixed number of seats in a entering class, every student you accept is one fewer seat you have for someone else. It has to be zero sum game. We understand, but race is not a category which is deterministic to a large degree of the composition of our classes. But it is a category that's important for us so that we can make sure that we are able to establish a good class. And we've tried race neutral alternatives before in, and they either all decreased our academic uh, success or they decreased our level of diversity. So we do not see a compelling alternative in this case. Okay, I think you have 10 seconds left if you wanna wrap up. Uh, okay, thank you so much, your honors. We pray that the court will uphold the rulings of the lower courts and leave Gruder intact. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. All right, I think we have now five minutes uh, rebuttal time for petitioners. Whenever you're ready, please come back on the camera and you can begin. Thank you. May it please the court. Um, this court should rule in favor of petitioners for two reasons. First, personal experiences do not equal race. And second, UNC's policy also fails narrow tailoring. First, using crude just uh, crude uh, stereotyping based on race is not the same as looking at applicants' individual personal experiences. Using a checkbox, as the respondents allege they, that UNC does, in order to determine a person's experiences is stereotyping. As How can you take that? Yeah, I, I don't understand that, that argument. Like, I mean, well, sure, I, I grant your argument. Let's, let's assume that it is stereotyping. I mean, is it an accurate stereotype that, you know, there is a higher likelihood that you will experience X, Y, and Z if you're race A, B, and C? Is well, that not no. an accurate stereotype? No, Your Honor, that is accurate. However, the problem is assuming that every single student who checks a particular box on the Common App has those same experiences. Well, I don't so think schools... they, they do that necessarily, right? I mean, we don't assume that everyone who gets a perfect score on the SAT is going to ace all their classes. I mean, it's it's kind of a mixed bag, right? We 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 take we stereotype all over, and I, I guess I don't. I, what I don't understand is why this one is is necessarily pernicious. This is different, Your Honor, because race is a protected class under the Fourteenth amendment. Schools well, so this can't... actually makes me, this ra this raises a, a point you raised earlier with Brown that I, I don't quite understand because you seemed rather confident that Brown was merely an anti-discrimination case when I think it's a fair read of Brown that it's an anti-subordination -sub uh, case. And even if you disagree on whether it's an anti-discrimination case and therefore no affirmative action or anti-subordination that might countenance affirmative action, what I don't understand is how Gruder can be grievously wrong given two very reasonable interpretations of, of our core precedent here? Well, Your Honor, we have to look at a couple different things. Um, but when we're, well, first, Your Honor, it's because Grutter does something that is unacceptable under the 14th Amendment. Grutter says that you can look at a student, know only the race of that student and not that student's personal experience, and then add that person to a class in order to increase the diversity of that class and to increase the ways that students get to interact with students with different experiences without actually knowing anything about that individual student's personal experience. So it's a different analysis to say that UNC can admit a student because they wrote in an essay that their Asian American heritage encouraged them to pursue Asian studies. That's an experience. That's acceptable because it's not using race to admit that student. So, if, Counselor, what, what if there was a question that said, um, check this box if you were a descendant of a former slave? Would that be allowed? Well, Your Honor, that would be, it, it depends, first of all, on how they're using that information. Are they using that information to give descendants of former slaves a benefit over other students based merely on their ancestry. I mean, couldn't uh, we couldn't we stipulate as a categorical rule if you're descending from a slave, you're at a disadvantage? Isn't that like a hundred percent? You know, I mean, hundred percent odds. Uh, I think that's very likely. Um, but as we said, in, or this this court said in Baki, we can't use affirmative action as a way to me to fix past societal ills. When we look at achieving educational diversity, which again is a laudable goal, if not a compelling state interest, we have to look at ways 
But, but okay, let, let's say we rule in your favor and the entering class at UNC is like, let's say three black kids, right? What do we say to all the black children who are denied entry to UNC? What, 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 what should the Supreme Court justice say to them? Well, Your Honor, while that would be unfortunate, again, racial diversity is a great goal. It is not- okay, wait, This goes back to my first question to you all. How can this court continue to exist? How do we survive this public scrutiny if we're telling thousands of black children nationwide, no, you- you cannot receive the benefits from action that your father and grandfather had. How can we do that? Well, Your Honor, um, the Supreme Court's decisions are not based on outside opinion. They're based on essential constitutional principles. And one of those principles is that your educational outcomes aren't determined by your race. Now, we've seen from other states and other schools that banning affirmative action does not lead to significant drops in diversity. There are a plethora of other ways to achieve good educational diversity. What if it's not enough? What if, it, you know, California says it's not enough. Maybe Michigan says it is. What if it's not enough? What if, uh, you know, California is a diverse state. UNC maybe it's not as diverse. What if they just can't achieve the diversity they need? Is the answer just too damn bad? Well, first of all, they need to keep experimenting and trying new things. And if they can't achieve anything, are students then... guinea pigs? I mean, are we just experimenting on classes? I mean, this person's life we're talking about. We're just experimenting, like, you know, putting baking soda and vinegar in a volcano. Is that all we're doing? Well, we're experimenting by seeing if we give preference to people with lower income, does that it improve the school? Um, if we look at other factors, does that improve the school? I see our time has ended. May we conclude? Yeah, you can conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> I have to laugh. I, I, I have trouble holding it. And I, I have to... <laughs> <laughs> um all right both teams come back online all right so you guys did great uh this is this is really strong um what i what i loved about both both teams is we came at you really hard and we were cutting you off we were interrupting asking really long questions ryan your wind up is like three minutes it felt like right uh, uh and which means you have to sort of keep track of all the moving parts because it's like Repeat the question, please. Justice Breyer did do this all the time. <laughs> um, and you held your ground, except when you didn't need to, right? When you could give ground, you gave ground. But when you had to hold your ground, you held your ground. Um, you were smooth. I didn't get the sense that you were frustrated. A couple of times you, you just, you paused a little bit, which is fine. Um, your pacing is good. Your tone is good. Your diction is good. Uh, also, uh, for Ryan's benefit, the, the, the high schoolers, they do in pairs of two. It's sort of different than we do in law school. I thought the handoffs were pretty seamless. I thought it was very yeah. smooth from one to the other. I didn't feel that one of you was necessarily dominating the other. At one point, I think Emily maybe maybe misspoke a little bit, and then her partner jumped in there to sort of bail her out, which is fine, right? That that's the nature of the competition. You you can't do that at the Supreme Court because you're on your own. But at least in our competition, you're allowed to do that. So that's good. Um, and I, I I see an actual um, increase in sophisticated arguments in the last round. So we had a couple weeks ago. So we had the first round. Now this is the second round, and you got better, right? You improved. I'm sure you watched your video. I'm sure you reviewed what you said. You said, oh, why did I do that? And I should have said this, right? And you improved. And you kind of got the gist of, of how we're going to attack, which is why I came at you with different angles. I didn't, I don't think I used, I tried all new questions. I'm not sure if I did, but I think got mostly new questions. And uh, I'm sure Ryan and, and, and Corey have some comments as well, but that was very strong. And uh, all four of you could walk into a law school tomorrow and compete in a moot court competition easily. I can say that with a high degree of confidence. Yeah, probably get to the finals too. Um, yeah, I, I thought y'all were fantastic. Um, so uh, without repeating anything that Josh said, I, I think that the one thing I'd love to compliment both sides on is the specificity of the sources that you were citing to the justices were fantastic. So for example, on the petitioner side, y'all cited several cases by name um, I, I don't care that you uh, did, got the Roberts name wrong. You got the quote right. And that's a fantastic quote to, to, to use for your advantage from, uh, from parents involved. Um, I love your degree of sophistication of being able to answer a question, not just with what you think and policy, but actually y'all have said this before at a court. Here's the case that said so. Fantastic. On the respondent side, similarly, I loved your citation to the Kaiser study. I thought that was great. Um, it's, it, we, I mean, I forget who, if someone cut you off really quick, but I was writing it down like, oh, cool. Like if I were a judge, I would then go look at that study. Similarly, your citation to the Freedmen Bureau, perfect legal history. That was excellent. Mm -hmm. So I loved that aspect of your arguments. Um, I felt like that kind of sets you apart because if all you end up getting into to the argument is, 
you know, yes, it's compelling. No, it isn't. And now let's just fight about different synonyms for the word compelling. It gets boring. Uh, but y'all didn't do that. Um, so I, I applaud you both. I, I, all four of you, I think you did fantastically. I thought you guys, yeah, I, I felt I felt it was on par, possibly even with the U.S. Supreme Court argument. <laughs> Maybe, I, you know, I, I don't want to go over the top, but I, I do think it was um, very good. I thought you guys, I, I felt sort of the genuineness um, and kind of just like the tone. And I think it was a great job also with the splitting off. Like I felt both of you were pretty balanced and had a good kind of chemistry in terms of <laughs> making it kind of a, a viewing experience. It sounded like one one team. Um, so full disclosure, I mean, Professor Blackman mentioned, I, I did file a brief in this case in favor of the Students for Fair Admissions, and I've, I've felt very strongly about this my whole life, but I was, I'm also trying to judge this, you know, fairly and neutrally. And I will say to the UNC team, um, I, I, I thought you actually was like, perhaps better than the UNC lawyer actually went to the Supreme Court argument, but I thought the, the Swedish example was kind of like very, very sincere and kind of like, I, I don't, I don't believe it factually entirely, but I felt like that's, if I had a you know listen to a UNC you know, administrator talk, that's probably what the example they would give, and they and they're trying to do the best they can under precedent that's confusing and contradictory and has its own you know problems. Um, so kudos to you guys for um, you know softening my heart a little bit on, on the issue. Um, but I thought you guys were both yeah very well prepared and um, very polished. Good job. Right, <clears throat> and so now specifically, I tried to make you all laugh. Um, not deliberately, but I wanted to throw the most ridiculous thing I could at you and see if you broke character, right? With the baking soda and vinegar, my God, what am I even thinking, right? I, uh, you know, experiment like little guinea pigs on, on a bunch of little children. Um, I also tried to make you wince. I said, so what are you going to say to those children who you're excluding from class, right? There's not a good answer there, right? I tried to, because I mean, Sotomayor does this, right? She will sometimes throw something at you that's like really sort of personal and cuts to the core of what people are going to feel from this decision. And look, you can make arguments in originalism all day long, but you're going to get those sort of really difficult personal questions. And I was trying to do the other side, you know, forget Kaiser, right? 80%, whatever the numbers are, you know, these two people live next door to each other with the same world experience. How do you say they're different? Uh, oh, check boxes, a checkbox for slavery. I think Kavanaugh asked about that, the argument, uh, if memory served. Um, uh, and also for the respondents, you didn't know the case of the croissant, which was fine. And Leaky the writing said, Your Honor, I'm not familiar with that case. Can you describe it? Good. And then I described it to you, maybe not as well as I could have, but I think I described it to you as quickly as I could. And then you were able to run with that and sort of give an answer based on that. It's going to happen at any argument that a judge asks something and you just don't know. Don't. And it's possible the judge is wrong. Like they're using the word incorrectly, or they yes. they they're, they're mixed up. They're literal, and then I mean that actually did happen at the students for fair admissions argument. There was like, I won't name names, right? But there was a justice who asked something, and everyone in the room was just like, "That's not what the word means." And you just have to kind of politely just, just figure some way to be polite and kind of roll with it. <laughs> I've right. done that with judges multiple times, where they've cited some big case and are all puff about it, and I'm like, "I don't know that case." Like that's absolutely, I've I've literally done that in court. Yeah, and it's fine. You're allowed to do that, right? You don't have to. And you handled it well. Yeah, I thought yeah. so too. I wrote down like great response to Croson. Yeah, it's fine. Again, you said, oh my God, I don't know the case. Whatever, right? It's fine. People forget it, it happens. Um, but that, that was good. I also appreciated uh, that you sort of had respect for the other side. And I think um, I think uh, Peter actually asked me something like, if you want to ask us in response to something what the other side said, right? That's the right gist. You don't need to say that because that's actually going to lead off. But but you're exactly thinking the right direction. It's it's. I I treat this hour or about forty minutes as a conversation from side to side, and I, I even went back during the rebuttal to the opening statement, the first question I posed, to sort of loop it back in to try and make a theme, and that's how you have to read an argument. You can't just pick out pieces. But this was very strong, and uh, I'm just I'm very very impressed with all four of you, all four of you. It's I forget I forget your high schoolers, but you're you're doing exceptionally well. Go to law school. Go to law school, yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, Corey's in Austin. So if you want, I can connect you later if you guys want to go um, uh, uh, meet up for coffee or something sometime because it's, you know, you got a resource in your backyard. If you're ever in, I'm sorry, you guys are in, we're in Connecticut. Are you based? Uh, we're in Lakeville. Where is that? It's the it's middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> how, how far is it from New York? Or is it is it far from New York? New York. City? Ordered. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to, to give prep, but I just know that these they're in Austin and they're close by to where Corey lives. But if you ever want to give me a call, I'm happy to just think over Zoom, whatever else. I, I always try to be fair to, to my and students. We're we're both international students. So we we had the yeah, so that we had the Swedish example kind of <laughs> just just naturally. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Um we're so you're from Sweden. Peter, where are you from? I'm originally from Russia, but recently I, I'm a refugee who lives in uh, Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Okay, well, uh, that's that's there are a lot of a lot of refugees in Virginia now. It seems. Um, do you have any questions for us that we can help answer for you? Uh, no, Your Honor, but we would like to thank you because last time we did not have good knowledge of the format, so we kind of came out of the gate and started attacking the other team, <laughs> screaming yeah. they want to overturn <laughs> Brown. Everything's about to. <laughs> no, I noticed. No, I noticed. You figured out the game. No, I. I mean, to be candid, I recognize last round is you didn't quite have the rules of the game, but you had this sort of raw talent. So I think that helped your scores go up. And I was like, okay, they'll come back stronger. And, and you did, you improved substantially. I think you probably did a lot of prep uh, to get right to this point. And I would say like lots of attorneys like are a little bit too hostile. Uh, when you get to the Supreme court level, they're at least usually the quality where y'all are at very deferential to opposing counsel. But if you go to trial court, some of them are just yelling nonstop at the other side anyway, and the judges have to bat them down. Yeah. Very good. All right. Anything else that the teams want to ask us? All right. Well, we, what's going to happen next is I'm going to talk to the judges. We'll put some grades in for you all. Uh, this is the top 12 teams. Four will advance the next round. I'm going to have a few circuit judges grading that one uh, for over Zoom. Yeah, I don't know who. We'll, we'll figure out who. And the championship round will be April. I think I said it's that Monday. It's the 24th the 25th. 24th in Washington, D.C. I already have booked the Georgetown Supreme Court Institute. I have a couple of D.C. circuit judges will be there. Uh, so it'll be it'll be fun. All right, very cool. Thank you so we'll much break a leg, Steven. everybody. You did wonderfully. And, thank you uh, so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Have a nice day. All right, let me turn off the recording so we can talk.